Hi, I'm Linda Rumpf, reading tutor and parent support coach, and I am here today with Genius in the House, Nora Shabazi. Welcome, Nora. Thanks, Linda. I'm happy to be here. Great. Well, I'm going to give a little uh, introduction first to you, Nora. Um, <clears throat> Nora is a leading literacy expert, and she has spent more than 25 years really revolutionizing reading instruction. She is the creator of Ebly, Evidence-Based Literacy Instruction. Is that what it means? Mm -hmm. yep. yep. And she's provided um, this amazing resource to the world. Um, she has provided Ebly training, coaching, and support to thousands of educators worldwide and taught Ebly to countless learners of all ages and ability levels. So this is perfect for our audience, for parents. And Nora's been a featured speaker at many conferences across the nation, including Plain Talk for Literacy and Learning and the Reading League. She's collaborated extensively with groups, organizations, all kinds of stakeholders who are focused on uh, beating this literacy crisis, on implementing research aligned instructional practices and really taking meaningful action toward all of our goal, which is that all the kids can read. Um, she was also the literacy consultant for the documentary, The Truth About Reading, and participated in panel discussions um, after more than a dozen screenings of the film, including at the SXSW Film Festival. And she's on the board of the Reading League Michigan and co-founded a collaborative group focused on increasing awareness and expanding awareness of what makes um, reading teaching effective, what eff effective and efficient literacy practices. So Nora, you've been featured all over the place, mm -hmm. multiple TV, radio, documentary interviews, podcasts, and you were on Emily Hanford's Soul to Story podcast and at a loss for words radio documentary the pbs building the breeding brain documentary oprah radio you got interviewed by maya angelou <laughs> wow so nora's amazing genius in the house and she she is just dedicated to this mission of teaching the world to read so nora thank you so much for being here and the first thing I guess we should do is just talk about what is Emily? What is this amazing uh, thing that you've created? And how is it different from other evidence-based literacy programs? Thank you, Linda. I just feel uplifted by your really happy, uh, energetic introduction. That's very sweet of you. Thank you. Um, yeah, first I want to share a little bit how I got on this path because it's very atypical. And I think that the parents listening to this um, will be able to relate. I am actually a nurse um, by education, and I worked in neonatal intensive care for a decade before my life took me on this literacy journey, thanks to my own child. So uh, how I got into this was because my child back in the mid 90s, my middle daughter was in second grade and was in gifted and talented in math. Uh, the Iowa test is what, what was given back then. And she was in the 98th percentile on the Iowa test in math in second grade, but already a year below grade level in reading. And she was one of those fake you out readers where she could really memorize a lot of words and she could memorize a story. If she'd read a story, it had been read to her many times or, you know, the story at school, which they went over many times in a week, she could read it without looking at it. So she really obviously wasn't reading it. She memorized it. So anything that she was familiar with and had read, she could look like a pretty good reader, but not at all anything that was new or unusual to her that she hadn't seen before. And so I started really um, digging into that. I still had a preschooler at home, so we'd moved back to Michigan from Guam. Uh, my then husband was a doctor in the Navy. And I started really looking into like, what's going on here? Because she was taught in a whole language way, more like balanced literacy kind of shifted to that along the same lines. When we came back to Michigan, but in Guam, she was taught a very traditional systematic phonics program called ABECA, which is, uh, there's a program called Open Court that um, ABECA is based on. And neither of those things were helpful to her. So I started researching reading. Pretty intensive, maybe you could say obnoxiously, I guess, you know how us parents can be when, when you're, we're, us mama bears are doing something for our children because they're suffering. I mean, 
no holes barred on that. And I was definitely putting all my time and energy into this. So I was then after doing a lot of things, researching, going to, you know, trainings, going to schools and observing things, reading research, reading so many books. About six months in, I, my mom actually told me about 12 year old twin neighbors of hers that were dyslexic and in special ed. And they'd gone to this place in East Lansing. I live in mid Michigan, about, so about an hour away from me. And in 12 hours, they improved so much that they got out of special ed. And from what I'd been reading and researching, this sounded a little bit fishy or a lot fishy. So I called the place and the person who ran it, a former professor at Michigan State, answered the phone and told me about a book called Why Our Children Can't Read and What You Can Do About It. And she said, the research shows, this was in 1997, mind you, the research shows exactly what we need to do to teach anyone and everyone. So the highest to the lowest to doesn't matter how to read to their highest potential. And it should be done very quickly. But we don't, I, she had been a professor at Michigan State University for 30 years. And she said, we don't teach teachers how to do this. And I thought, what an odd thing, you know, can that really be true? And of course, I've learned a lot about that over the years that it is. So um, she said, and, you know, I asked her, is it phonics? Is it whole language? She said, you know, both of those things have good to them because everything does, but there's also things that will hold back many students in both of those. And I'm like, well, what's door number three? And she told me about the Why Our Children Can't Read book, which is a um, linguistic phonics or speech to print methodology, or we've termed it, uh, this group that we did that summit with, structured linguistic literacy. So starting from speech first. So I said, whatever it is, get me the book. And she said, I had to get it from the publisher. Got the book, read the whole thing before I went to bed the night I got it in the mail. And then uh, it talked about a book that I highly recommend. If you're a parent of an emerging reader, a four or five, a six-year-old um, that's starting off on their journey, this type of instruction works for everybody. Again, the very highest who pick up reading easily and those who struggle and have a very hard time with it. The way to teach them is the same. And there's a book called, and I have it right here actually, um, it's called Reading Reflex. You can get it for less than $15 online. And it uses a program called Phonographics. But you cut out some stuff. It's great, especially your kids, neurotypical kids that just need to learn to read. Use that book. It'll have really what you need in there. And I used that book because uh, the uh, Why Our Children Can't Read mentioned it. Um, and I used it with my daughter. for, And I did about three hours of instruction with her. And she came home from school and asked me if she could read this Bailey's School Kids chapter book. Now, she'd never, she always asked to be read to, but had never asked to read a book. And I thought, you can't read, really, is what I thought. And I'm like, okay. And so she sat on the little couch in her den and she flipped the pages at the right time. I kept peeking at her and she finished the entire book and told me all about it. And she's been a voracious reader ever since. Now, her spelling, took two years to remediate. But I thought, hmm, no, I knew nothing. I'm like, that's weird. Cool. So I taught other people's kids in my house just volunteering. And I kind of accidentally started a reading center. My then husband wanted to, had rented a building for a wellness center. And he said, why don't you teach those kids in the center so they're not in our house or whatever? I said, okay. And a couple, like six weeks before he was going to launch this wellness center, everything fell through. So I had a whole reading center. So anyway, I became trained in phonographics, the program it talks about, and I trained teachers um, for, I taught kids, of course, and then I, uh, at my center, and I also trained teachers for about four years. But I realized that it was limited just to decoding, which reading is much more than that. And also there were other limitations that I wanted, I had learned over the years from, you know, those four years. And I didn't feel comfortable being a phonographics trainer because I wasn't really training in that anymore. It was beyond that. So I quit as that. And I was, considered going back into nursing. And then a, a nonprofit foundation offered to pay for any teacher in their county to be trained by me. So I needed something to train them in. And that's how Ebley was born in 2003. So what is it that makes Ebley different um, is that it's the approach of how you actually teach the reading. It comes from what kids know naturally, which is their speech. So we start with speech and full words that they say breaking them down by sound and then adding the letters. We're almost all instruction in reading traditionally, definitely the vast majority has been more the letters leading, which speech is natural. The letters are man-made, but the letters like B says B and you start with all these isolated letters. With Ebley, we never teach anything in isolation at all. Whether we're teaching a three-year-old or a 
50 year old. It all starts from the word, breaking it down and then matching these man-made letters to what we know naturally, which is our speech sound sounds. And there's a lot more to it also, but the focus of the explicit instruction, of course there's content and knowledge and, and what's going on with the code, but it's on the alphabetic principle. We give this explicit instruction on this thing that's very nebulous and confusing in reading, which is that when we say a sound, like if I say a ah and at, that a ah is spelled with one letter. If I say E like in the word T, whether it's a golf tea or the kind you drink, that E is spelled with two letters, either E, E or E, A. If I say the word Psi, right, that I, G, H is three letters to spell one sound I. Or if I say the word weigh, like how much do you weigh, that E, I, G, H is a symbol to represent one sound A. This is something that's like to most of the teachers. We have trained, as, as you said, thousands of teachers over the past 25 years. And they're like, what? I mean, I've always been a great reader and writer and that was a revelation to me. So that's one of the, the concepts that we teach explicitly. The other one is that almost all the sounds that we say in English, there's about 44 sounds, can be spelled, depending on dialect, can be spelled in more than one way. So if you take the sound shh, that's the winner, um, really as far as how many ways to spell it, there's 20 ways to spell shh. We think of SH and shop or wish, right? But we don't think of SSI and mission or uh, SHI and fashion, or there's a lot of them. There's more common ones like TI and motion or CI and special, but there's 20 ways to spell the sound shh. The vast majority of pretty much everyone thinks of one, right? So whether it's vowels or consonants, the sounds that we spell, that we say can be spelled in more than one way. That's a concept that's very abstract and needs to be taught explicitly, which is what we do. Um, and then the other concept that's also abstract is that the same spelling, letter or group of letters, can, can represent more than one sound. So for example, the CH in my name, Shabazi, represents the sound sh. Most people know of CH as ch, like in chip, right? Or child or whatever, but it also can, can represent k in one of the words kids are most, you know, er, uh, what do I wanna say, they're um, exposed to the most, early in their life is the word school. That CH represents the sound k in school, right? So the same spelling, different sounds, the letter A, there's nine sounds that go with the letter A. We typically tell kids if we're teaching phonics, that can be long, like A, the letter name, or short, A, like the what you're first, you know, originally taught. So that covers a small percentage of that. But then like in the word Nora, it's the representation for a, uh, now which happens a lot. And people say that's a schwa which I've never even figured out in my head, like what does that really mean as far as application? I still haven't to this day. Um, or it can be ah in father or ah in wall or i in luggage or a whole bunch of things, o in war. So that same letter can represent a bunch of sounds. So explicitly teaching this concept from the outset is what absolutely like puts Ebley on warp speed, mm -hmm. right? So in the, in the way that we teach, teaching those explicitly while adding, of course, the the man-made code, because that's what it's all around, um, really helps the learner accelerate their, any learner and every learner. Once they understand and have been explicitly taught this process and these concepts, then they can apply it to everything. So we can teach, we don't have to teach to mastery, we can teach in this interleaving way that where you keep, if you're reading, you're constantly going to be exposed to CH, whether it's K or SH or um, CH, right? And you're going to be exposed to lots of words with the letter A unless it's very controlled text, which we move it kids into authentic text because we've given them, given them a foundation and a platform to understand these concepts in English and also how to apply them. So they move to self-teaching and intrinsic learning very quickly. Even kids who have had traditional phonics instruction for years. I mean, I had kids who've had 13 years of, of tutoring in traditional phonics with rules and syllable types and all of that, and are still, you know, the one that I had for 13 years, she was 21 and at a fourth grade reading level. And after just a few hours of Ebley instruction, she was actually, for the first time ever she, in her life, she read a novel. So we want to move these kids. We don't have the luxury of time. We need to move kids far and fast so they can do the whole point of reading, which is read and understand what they're reading and write so that people can understand what they're writing, you know, spelling correctly and knowing how to do that. So. Yeah, it's it's really become my life's work, of course, my life's purpose, my as you can tell, my passion, because I know the suffering of my child, and she only suffered for a short amount of time. Many parents have experienced that suffering for years, 
and um, with their kids. And and a lot of people don't look at the secondary suffering of parents. You don't. People don't really think about that trauma that happens with that. And it's very, you know, tragic. You know, very much for the child, but also for the parent who's doing everything that they can, and you know not getting their children to their highest potential or where they want to be so that they can they can interact in a literate society. So I really, um, with Ebley, I, we've been very grassroots. I've never had any, you know, I don't have any background in business, just like I don't officially in education either, but I've never had people who are investors or people who are partners to, to try to take the focus off what the top focus is, is what's highest and best for kids and their literacy. Oftentimes people want to dilute things. Um, and because I'm an independent, you know, business or whatever, I don't have to worry about that. I can do the right things and I don't veer from that. I stay very pure with what we do for the best and highest of, of course, the kids, but also for the people teaching them, which can be obviously Ebly is in it, Ebly works for every single student. We have it in classrooms, which is where I really would like ideally for it to be in K3 classrooms. So we have the fence at the top of the cliff instead of all these ambulances that we need at the bottom. Because, <laughs> you know, when kids become adults, they are still subliterate, meaning not reading anywhere near their potential. And they that trauma just compounds unless we put, you know, really get them so that they were reading and writing and spelling um, to their to their potential, which is usually a whole lot higher than it's expected, especially with kids with dyslexia, which my daughter had every single sign of dyslexia. I didn't really know much about it. And Diane McGinnis in her book kind of disses it. And so I'm like, okay, well, that's, you know, I don't need to think about that. So it didn't, it, it's been many years after she's now 34 years old, that I even thought to think of her, all of the ways that she, you know, um, displayed the dyslexic traits, right? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of suffering that's unnecessary. And for me, that's my number one purpose is to alleviate that. And also, prevent it. My, my reading center is called Ounce of Prevention. Mostly we do training for teachers, but we do a lot of training for homeschoolers, a lot of training for interventionists. We've had high schoolers take our training. Nobody who teaches Ebley here at my center, and some of them have been here over 20 years, has a background in education. So anyone can teach it, right? Obviously educators too, but educators have taught a lot of other things. So often it's challenging to, to shift, but parents, nobody, and we all, if you're a parent, you know, Nobody is going to have that intensity to do what you can for your child like a parent. You know, we're going to, if our children are suffering, we're going to do something about it. And that's really kind of what's changed the entire trajectory of my life. So, yeah. That's great. Uh, so amazing. When you were talking about this, I was uh, remembering the statistic about how the general public reads at what, like a fourth or fifth grade level? And mm -hmm. I mean, we know, like parents who are tuning in to this summit, um, in most cases are going to have a child who's some type of struggling reader, mm -hmm. if not if not diagnosed with dyslexia. Yes. And, <clears throat> but think about the general public. And like you said, um, it's not just struggling readers. It's, it's all of us who are missing out on mm -hmm. really being able to read at a higher level. And I think, Linda, that's a good point to say that many parents across, it doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what your zip code is, it doesn't matter. And, and the truth about reading the documentary that you had mentioned purposely talks a lot about some very successful doctor, teachers, highly you know marketing executives who were multimillionaires, who were significantly subliterate and reading at a low elementary level that were successful, but still traumatized by this. Because when we get to that adult, it's not like we wake up one day when we're 18 and all of a sudden we can read. So there are many parents who remain subliterate. Of course, more than half of our population are. So of course there's going to be. And then that brings a level of anxiety when you have children who are experiencing the same thing, because now these parents know what that feels like. Now talk about anxiety. I mean, yeah. So, and, and, the, and the cool thing about that really with Ebley is that when the parents are teaching their kids Ebley, they're learning also. I have one person who had her, her master's in literacy and she's been a teacher for many years. She's in her fifties and she's been teaching Ebley now for a couple of years. And she said, 
just by teaching Ebly, she's dyslexic, just by teaching Ebly, I have rewired my brain. Not only is my reading improved, my thinking is improved, my vocabulary, my expressive, everything has improved. And all she does is just shout from the rooftops about Ebly. She's like, we need to do this. You know, she was an OG teacher for many, 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 many years too, and then shifted to, um, to Ebly. And she's, you know, people, when they see, it sounds like, Swampland in Florida, a lot of times that you can, you know, help kids this quickly until you actually, and even me, after all these years, I still think, is this really, is this really happening? Because it's a cognitive dissonance because it's so different from what everybody is, is used to happening. You know, t parents are told this is going to be years. They're never going to be a fast reader. They're never going to be a good speller. And that's just not the truth. You know, they certainly can be and, and a lot quicker than we typically think. So I think that that anxiety of parents too, sometimes if they're experiencing some of these same anxieties, like I'm not really that great at that. So maybe they got it from me or how am I supposed to help them? Which adds another layer uh, to the whole thing. Yeah. And <clears throat> I think, well, you use the term subliterate. And so, I mean, I think that most people who read at, you know, they say the general public reads at this fourth, fifth grade level, but I think most people who can read, basically read, um, wouldn't think of themselves as subliterate. But really, there are so many higher thoughts out there in so many more complex books that yes. you just think about how the whole population is not reading those higher thoughts, yes. the more complex and complicated yes books and that then you get this sort of like loss of knowledge overall mm -hmm. kind right. of dumbing down of the whole which is huge world. because that's how we all get i think if i've lived I've, i mean i have traveled around the world but i've extensively traveled around the road because of books and because of all of the you know and i want to learn about a topic I, you get a book or I read an article or you all of that that's so so true as far as that really dumbing down across the board and um and we don't think about that. One of the questions we ask always, and this is a true tell, how is your spelling? We ask that of parents, we ask that of adults. If you are not spelling accurate, no, nobody's a perfect speller, right? We all miss spell words. I'm a great speller and a great reader and I still miss that. You're going to, because we keep, spelling is something you keep learning throughout life. But if you're misspelling, spelling, you know, a third of the words or which many kids are, or consistent misspelling where people can't really read what you're writing, but I'm a great reader, you're not reading anywhere near your potential. And this is why, I mean, I purposely used and, and thought, tried to think of what's the word that I could use that we're not blaming children for their not reading and spelling to their potential. Experiencing subliteracy is, is what they're experiencing. It doesn't mean that their brain is broken or that they can't have this, but it means, and it's a continuum. It can be they're reading at a first grade level or a fourth grade level, right? Even a seventh grade level. But when you're trying to read more complex, you're reading much below where your potential is. And so subliteracy for me, many terms, and I really dislike this, blame the child. Well, they have this, so they can't. And I've seen that across the board everywhere. I've seen it in schools. I've seen it in our center. I've seen parents have been conditioned to think that like, well, they can't, they, you know, they've got this or that or whatever the Disability. label is. Yes. yes. And disability means you're not able. And if you think they're not able, you're not going to put that bar up here to get them at or above grade level. So, yeah. Yeah. So you talk about books. I've noticed in our previous conversation and um, and then, you know, here today, even you are very well read. You are a book hound, aren't you? <laughs> I am. Yes. And one of the things that I really think about a lot and I try to really infuse into my own uh, reading lessons is love of reading because I feel like um, when you love reading, then you do it, right? And then you I, I, I do want to say, you're not going to love it. Like, I don't really love technology. You know how we were just trying to figure out... I am not automatic at technology. I'm not great at technology. It's, it's, I have to be at that sensory remoter level and it's a lot of work and I waste a lot of time. So if that's your experience with reading, which so many of our kids are, I hate, re people hate reading when they can't do it, right? They're not going to love, 
unless we teach them actually how to read so that they can free up their, you know, quickly enough so they can free up their brain and comprehend all these great things, it's not going to be fun. I mean, David in The Truth About Reading, the 62-year-old multimillionaire I taught, he was he was angry at the beginning. He said, why would anybody love reading? I have no idea what the hell is wrong with them. And he might have used some stronger terms than that. And I was like, okay. And even, I think it's in the movie. Actually, it is in the movie, the part where he's just like, oh my gosh, I'm seeing a picture in my head. I get this. Now he cannot get enough. He's reading five books. I mean, this is several years later, but five books at a time. He didn't, he's like, I couldn't finish a book. I couldn't read it fast enough. But you're not going to love reading that if you, nobody's taught you or you haven't learned how to do it in a way that you can actually experience all that great, you know, uh, what's in those great books, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's why I always have a lot of conversation. And this is how you and I really connected on the speech part, because I saw that I need to lead the kids to wanting to know things, right? Because that's what books are. In books, mm -hmm. you find things out, right? And human beings just want to know, like we're naturally curious. We yes. naturally want to expand our thinking. That's what we're here for, right? That's what our brains are designed to do. So I, I pull them into conversation and we talk about things. And then when we get to a book, um, if they're going a little slowly, sometimes I'll just flip into talking about all the characters and the things that have happened so far in the book and just bringing that into a desire. Yeah. You know what's going to happen next. Yeah. Right. And, and asking them what they think. Yes. You know? It's going to happen next. I mean, that, all of those great skills that are good for enhancing your comprehension. And you, that's another good point, Linda, is that for us, especially kids who have experienced subliteracy chronically, they are like, do not take me to another place. Do not put me in front of another person. Do not torture me anymore. Enough parents, right? So they oftentimes come in our place or whatever, or even online, which we work with kids all over the world. They're not amused, to put it mildly. And what we do is work really hard to find out what they're passionate about. Because if they're passionate about dirt bikes or sharks or all these things that I don't know about, like the video games and stuff. And what's that one? Minecraft. Minecraft's a big one. What you're passionate about, we are going to find something about that. Like we have one little girl who was reading very slowly, a fifth grader. She loves Taylor Swift. Well, guess what? She was much more engaged in doing the work of learning what's in there because she wanted to learn what's in there. So you kind of, kind of, you know, get them motivated by that. But we, it's people like, do we do this level or do we do this kind of book or do we have to have this decode? But I'm like, find, find what they love. Yeah. And then support them through it because if they can't read it independently, but then there's their, their learning is going to spiral even faster and higher, but it's so true because once you get that a hit of that, right, you want more of it. That's really exciting. Yeah. I call it bring in the joy, mm -hmm. bring in the joy. I'm like, yep. if it's not fun. Why do it? And that's yeah. because, and I also, when I coach parents, I talk about this thing called the kingdom of childhood. That's from my Waldorf background. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that we really have to put ourselves in the experience of being a kid and everybody would want to be there because being a kid is about wanting to have fun. Yes. yes. You know, and so, and, and but yeah. as we become adults, it's all about what we're supposed to Serious, do. Serious. Right? Yeah. And um, following what everybody thinks should be. Yeah. Right. But <laughs> if we bring the joy, if we concentrate on bringing the joy, then we have to look also deeply into what is the child naturally leaning toward, like in terms of their interests, like you're saying. Yes. And then when we bring those things, they then transfer that love eventually to reading itself. Yes. And then that's like the golden moment. Yeah. You know? And then you're like, woohoo. Yeah. When yeah. they pick out some book that's yes. like literary or something and go, oh, yeah. I, or some like a uh, dictionary thing, you know. And they get like parents tell us all the time. Oh my gosh, I told them it's time to go to bed and I find them in their room. They just can't stop reading and they've got a flashlight to keep reading. That's what we want, right? That's that's that joy of like, oh, I just can't that I have a same I can't read books for pleasure because I have no self-control to stop. <laughs> it's like, oh, now it's midnight. Well, just one more. Oh, now it's one. Now it's two. Now, you know, I really I kind of like have an addiction to reading and books and all of that stuff because it is a huge joy. And we yeah. wanna, yeah. Another book happen. you you had mentioned was called um, "Make It Stick." Mm -hmm. What yep, is I have that, what one. that book about? That's this one. Look at this. How about that? 
this is like about the, you know, we talk a lot about the science of reading, which is a great thing, but this is about the science of learning. And it's by some cognitive, three cognitive psychologists about how we actually really learn. And re it was, it came out in 2015. And when I first read it, I'm like, this is interesting because I created Ebley in 2003. And so many of the processes of how Ebley unfolds and how we train the teachers and also how we teach the kids follows almost to a T everything in this make it stick. A lot of it, and they say it in this book a lot too, is contrary to what you would think, like uh, teaching to mastery. They're like, not a good plan. You want to have that interleaving, right? And that spiral where you come back to things. And, and it really, it's kind of, it's not a very big book, as you can see, but it's kind of dense. So you want to, especially if this is new to you, but reading it and really thinking about like what, because it's not particularly about reading, it's about learning in general. So like, wait a minute, what are they saying here? And how does this apply to what we're doing? But it's a fantastic book on really um, guiding us on how to deliver instruction and the interaction of instruction. I mean, there's so many things in this book that, you know, have this integrated um, process of improving all learning. And it's, uh, yeah, I love that book too. It's a really one I highly recommend. Most of the books that I love the most, I mean, this is the one, this is probably my fifth version of this book. So you can see, this is not a book I don't love. I use this book all the time. This is the one that brought me on this journey um, 26 years ago. And that book, nobody ever talked about it. Now there's, if you are on the Science of Reading Facebook page, um, where there's like 2,500,000 people on there, a lot of educators, but a lot of parents too. We did a book study on this and people are becoming more aware of this structured linguistic literacy, speech first, linguistic phonics. Some people call it speech to print, but that's been used to, you know, some people think of that as just spelling or, or the book by Louisa Motz or whatever. So we've kind of faded away, you know, shied away from that. But this book, it, it talks all about that. And it's becoming more people are like, oh, because so much research coming out is supporting what's in this book and exactly how we teach with Ebley in a way that's more effective and more efficient. That's what we want. Other things, you know, can work or they may work over time or they may work somewhat um, and they may work some differently for different kids, of course, which happens. But we want effectiveness and we want efficiency. These kids don't have the time. And we also need to think about the trauma because there's, as I keep saying, there's so much trauma. When kids think they're the only one, they think there's something wrong with them. They think they're broken. They think they're stupid. They think all kinds of things that are untrue. It be, just because there's this thing called literacy out there, people are reading and people are writing and they think they're the only one that doesn't have access to it. And so, yeah, this book, I would recommend every, it's still my favorite book. I've read hundreds as you know, but it's still my favorite book, but it's gonna be different than most of the ones that, you know, are, mm, I don't know if I wanna say mainstream or whatever, but that most more people know about, yeah. And that's called, hold that up again for us, your favorite. Um, yep. Of all why our children can't read whoopsie whoo, where's my camera why our children can't read and what you can do about it diane mcginnis my hero she just passed away about a year or two ago which made me very sad um but she's a little spunky so she, her tone in there is like i've had enough i have had enough of us screwing all these kids get on it and do what you know you, you do you know which is a little off putting sometimes to me, again, I was like, wow, okay, she's serious, right? But it, some people can feel kind of triggered by it. And and she always used to say to me, I mean, whenever I have a book, there aren't that many, um, that I'm like, this is amazing. I contact the author and I contacted her 20 some years ago. And so we interacted a good bit until you know the last few years of her life. But um, she would always say, how are you in any schools? She was a cognitive psychologist in Florida um, and she's from England, but she said, I kept, you know, anybody I talked to anybody, but I think that her, you know, a little bit of abrasiveness, you know, she really was shoved in the corner and everybody's like, keep her away because she's a little too truthful with what she, <laughs> she doesn't have, wow. didn't have a lot of diplomacy in the eyes of many people, but I and thought she was a- Some of the best, ad, um, best, most courageous people are kind of like that, aren't they? Yes. Like, because their mission. Yeah. And then they're <laughs> frustrated. Yeah. They're like, why aren't you doing this? I think when I was in, went to nursing school, the very first book we uh, read was about this doctor called Ignis Semmelweis, was this back in the mid 1800s. And he realized he taught medical students and they did autopsies and then he delivered babies and all of his medical students did that too. And 30% of the women they delivered babies with died 
right? Um, and they thought the women are weak or whatever. And he realized that if you wash your hands and lie or whatever, that they brought down to 0% of the women were dying, okay? This is the very first day of nursing school that I, I was fascinated. I read that book in one day too. And what happened was all the doctors were furious saying, you're saying this is our fault. They got him fired and he wouldn't shut up. And then they got him excommunicated from the country. And then he still wouldn't shut up. And then they got him committed to an insane asylum where he was beaten and died of an infection. So that was in the 19, late 40s, 50s, I think. And back, then about 1900, when they realized germ theory and whoo, we are killing these people with sticking our hands in autopsy bodies and then into women and other things too. Um, they uh, brought, he was in an unmarked grave and all this. And now he's in a, they moved him. He's in a grave with a big monument and all this, you know, 50 years later. So I think, Diane McGinnis must be smiling in her, you know, in, down from heaven or whatever, because there's shifts going toward what she learned. But I think that the frustration, it, it dro drives people crazy. Like, wait, this is a simple solution. Why is it so much resistance? You know, mm -hmm. you know, when you were talking about her personality, I was thinking, well, at least she wrote the book. OK, she wrote the book. Yeah. So her leadership can shine out. But yes, I've been working with a coach. Um, who talks about how leadership is resisting being triggered. Oh, yeah. And I was yeah. thinking just now about that, like if we allow ourselves to have emotional responses to things like, why aren't people picking this up, what I'm trying to yeah. tell you, okay? Yeah. Or I'm, I absolutely know what I'm talking about and you're just not listening, you know, and nobody's listening. Like that can be an emotional trigger. And then when yeah. we show those emotional triggers, suddenly we're we're not in a leadership because we're not right. at a higher level than everyone yes. around us anymore. It's we're letting true. ourselves get upset, right? Yeah. And I was thinking, this is a really good lesson too for parents because it could be triggering for a parent. Ooh, you know, sometimes very. it's really hard for a parent to listen to a struggling reader work on their reading. Like I've had parents tell me I can't listen to it. Yeah. You know, now our audience today are homeschool parents. So we're thinking that, you know, you're you're gonna be having a, a few more muscles around this than yeah. than that. Though no, we're all human. And then again, when you're with your about your kids, that's a whole nother level too. And I think also like with Diane's book is the triggering of the people reading it. They are like, listen, lady, you know, and she's feisty, like I say, but but they're like, you're saying things that go against what are my beliefs or what I have learned. You know, I didn't, I was a blank slate. I'm like, wow, this makes sense, right? But I, teachers are gonna be triggered. Parents are, everybody's gonna be triggered, but you're so right. Like, can't we come from a place of, you know, loving, you know, kindness about, we're all trying to do the same thing, which is help children, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we work together and how do we uplift each other and support each other? and instead of attacking, you know, I think social media has brought that on, like, let's all claw each other's eyes out. I have no time or energy for that. I'm not interested. If you want to yeah. learn how to teach somebody how to read and do it well, I'm, I don't want to fight with it. If you don't want to, that's okay too. I completely respect that. But I'm not going to use my time, my precious time and energy to do that fighting, which some people seem to do full time on social media about all kinds of things. But I don't think it's a good use of time. You know, doing the action to help you know, bring the change. But I think that all of us, I mean, sometimes I get triggered and I try to keep it in my head, right? Because we're all going to, but you're right as far as how you react. And I think that people discovering like Ignace Semmelweis and Diane McGinnis and all is just like, wait a minute. I thought that you were just gonna like, this makes sense, this is working. Why are you resisting this? And I think that then you take it personally or who knows what, I don't know. I'm, you know, yeah. just assuming, yeah. but so, I it's mean, pretty complex. The more we talk about Diane McGinnis and this book, what is so radical in the book? Like, what is the thing, the, the thing that people would be like, oh, my gosh? Well, there's a few things. Um, the biggest one, which was so surprising to me that I didn't even know until a couple of years ago when I did a, a, a webinar that I was afraid to do comparing print to speech or traditional phonics to speech to print or structure linguistic literacy like Ebley. And I, I'm like I said, I am not a confrontation. People not want, wanting to fight. Just advertising for this. Talk about trigger. I mean, I was getting people say, "I can't wait to write." She does this uh, webinar so I can write a blog and just tear her to pieces. And I'm like, 
what? I, and the trigger of that, now there's some things like teach sounds first instead of labrador names and why. That, that can be a trigger. But the biggest trigger, which was the greatest shock to me, was how quickly you can remediate someone on average. No, it's, yeah, human beings are different. Some people, it just takes us like my daughter, three hours. Some, we've had two that are over a hundred hours. Some might be 35, 50 hours or whatever. But on average, it's very, very little. It is not two to four times a week for two, four, six, ten 10 years, right? It is not that. And so that is by far the greatest trigger. I mean, some people won't even look at what we do because they feel like that is like, I don't even really understand but I do know that I don't talk about it very much anymore. How, well, the time frame. But it's interesting to me that nobody talks about the time frame for remediation in general. And many schools have the same kid in intervention and remediation for the entire life in school. So for 10 years, you know, and it's like, no, no, that really shouldn't be for anyone where, you know, unless it's a really significant, um, you know, nonverbal, but even nonverbal kids can learn to read. So that mindset of like this is just they're broken and they're going to always be broken and i had a, a special ed guy from the state once say to me what we're doing for these kids who are disabled it's like the handicap rails in the bathroom we're giving we're giving them um supports to deal with their disability we're not trying to teach them and i was like oh i mean that makes a lot of sense right we're not trying to we don't think that they can become readers. So yeah, that's why they're sitting in the IEP them. room year after year after year. Oh, forever with having very low bar. Low bar. bar says, we our bar is here, 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 all the time. It's gonna yeah. be high. And guess what? Not only are we going to put it here, but we're going to help you get there. And and that's a huge shift in mindset. And again, because I haven't come up during the education through the education system, I have not been familiar with what thinking there is there. I mean it become familiar. Um, but it's almost like my ignorance was wonderful because I didn't I didn't follow any limitations. So I think that one of the reasons that um, that the world of supporting structured literacy approaches, which are, you know, supposed to be um, sequential, you mm -hmm. know, in other words, we start from the very simplest components of, say, phonics like ah, eh, eh, and then we go mm -hmm. up we go up step by step by step and that that's supposed to take two years to get through all the concepts. Um, I think um, one of the, one of the issues um, that a person who really supported doing it in a, in a sequential sort of longer process uh, fashion would talk about would be making sure there are no, gaps. Okay. So let's talk about that. So mm -hmm. your system works fast. It works from speech and uh, sound to the letters. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take two years and it's, I mean, everyone's different. Okay. But um, every child is going to be different and take a different amount of time. We know that, but we're cutting off all this time. So if someone comes to you and says, yeah, but are there gaps. So what do you say? Well, every human has gaps in everything <laughs> in every area, right? So what does that even mean? You know, what are the, are there gaps? No, we don't have to teach every letter and a, 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 a says a, apple or that. We don't need to do that because that's the man-made letters leading the instruction. It's new information in a kindergartner. Well, maybe some do, but most of them, this is going to be new stuff you know, as far as all this code, which has 44 sounds and about 150 spellings or so, and, you know, 50,000 words. Um, I don't know if that number's right, but I, yeah, I think that, yeah, about 50,000 to, 50 to 100,000 words. So all of that coming from this abstract man-made thing that you have to learn all of that, right? And then we're doing it in isolation. We would never teach a sound in isolation, like never, right? We, the first word we teach, preschoolers, kindergarten, am, what are the sounds in am? Ah, mm, we put placeholders for that. Then we show them the word and we pull, or we pull the sounds down to show that they're learning at and mm, in the context of something that's meaningful and relevant. Mm -hmm. This is important. When things are meaningful and relevant, we learn them better and faster and easier. 
So then we're teaching them ah, we're teaching them the next word might be map, right? Here's that at and mm again, but it's not in the same order. It's, you know, so it's teaching them so many things that are not, we're explicitly saying these are not going to be in the same order. We're not doing that. We're showing you, yep, here's this, and it can be at the, beginning, at the end, beginning, in the middle. We're going to do it in the context of a, of a whole word, which makes sense to you. And it's dealing with, you know, the word at, you use it all the time. The word map, you know what that is. If you don't know what a word is, we're going to explain it to you, but we know it's something that comes from what you know naturally, which is your speech. So there is very strong belief that you have to master, like this is something in the last couple of years, we've had literally hundreds and hundreds of people who had previously taught Orton Gillingham, you know, Barton, Wilson, one of those programs, MZ, whatever. There's a lot of different ones, which I wasn't really, I've been to some like one day trainings and stuff and, you know, followed the traditional phonics stuff, but that they did that. And now they've come to Ebley and they're what another thing that they really need to you know, say it's hard for them to let go of is mastery. Like we're going to teach you at, and we're going to teach it to you literally for weeks or months or even longer in the context of CBC words until you master it in reading and in spelling, right? Now these kids, after they've had all of that, even if they move on, oftentimes they have, they certainly haven't mastered it in spelling, right? But for like, for me, I, I when I had my physiology exam in nursing school, I remember one year I had crammed for it which make it stick will tell you is a very bad idea, but I did okay on the test, right? I did okay on that test. I couldn't have told you the next yeah. day anything about any of it. Yeah. I didn't learn it. I did the, you know, circus act, to make it look like it. So I could do, it's like kids with a spelling test. My daughter used to get hundred percent on every spelling test. We studied all week long. We'd burn the list when she came home on Friday, like hallelujah. She'd misspell <laughs> word, the exact same words from the spelling test in a writing that same day. She'd misspell them. She obviously didn't master them. Just because this test that we gave her after drilling her with it looked good doesn't mean if you can't apply it in real life, you haven't mastered it. But there's a mindset that we have to absolutely it'd be like with the computer. We don't get to use the computer, Linda, until we know how to make that QR code come on here. Nope, nope, nope. You got to master this before you can move on You know, to do that. It's not how humans learn, but it's very much how educators and parents and everyone with learning to read have been conditioned to believe it has to be, even though the research really goes against that, right? Understandable, of course, but that, and then when we're saying, you know what, we're gonna go to mastery for sure, but just not before you can learn anything else. We wanna get these kids, they wanna read Frog and Toad. They don't wanna read Matt and Sam Sat all the time. They wanna read fun stuff that they want. They wanna read the Cars book or the whatever. So we're gonna get them to that pretty quickly. And we're gonna show them by, explicitly teaching the concepts. Now you had said that the letters and doing that first is the concepts. They're, they're teaching the concept of the man-made alphabetic code from the code as opposed to the concepts that the alphabetic principle and the concepts that the code are wrapped around, right? That's the hard part that we teach explicitly. And it's the part that when you teach with the letters leading the instruction, you're assuming they're going to pick that up. And almost no one does. And I know that because when I teach rooms full of, of administrators mm -hmm. in a conference and I have them get a whiteboard or whatever that really panics them too and have them do a few of these activities, they're like, ah, they don't know that, right? They come and bring their kids to us. A lot of teachers and administrators that bring their kids to us and then they're like, in the first part of the first lesson we do, we show these kids these concepts and in a way that's meaningful and relevant and applying them. And these people are like, I was 36 when I learned this. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, I was a great reader and speller. I thought I'm much better now, much faster reader too. But I'm like, how did I not know this, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a, it's a whole different mindset and it's not what's out there you know, globally as much. People are like, well, wait a minute. They said, this is the gold standard, but why? Why is that? What is that doing? Why does nobody, it took me a long, 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 long time to figure out by searching and digging deep mm -hmm. with Orton Gillingham to compare when I was doing the speech to print versus print speech, how long are they teaching them? This was before all these people came to me and who could tell me that. Now it's, now I know because we have a lot of people who have taught it. If you go to the Ebley community Facebook page, we have a whole list of people's stories and many of them are former OG, my kid, until he was 13, we did OG, he was reading at a first grade level still. And then in months by the mom, the homeschool mom teaching him, he's at grade level, you know, and continues, he reads, he writes, he's, you know, more accurate all the time. So 
the outcome in the amount of time are mm -hmm. really important things to know, but nobody talks about them, right? Especially the time. And that's where I unknowingly in my you know na naivety, I should say, mm -hmm. saying the amount of time, I didn't realize how the triggering that would be. You know, now I do, which doesn't help me from back then. And now I don't talk about it too much. I mean, I am talking about it here because you're asking me explicitly, but mostly I shy very far because I don't want to fight. Okay, we don't we don't have to talk about the time. You'll yeah. find out when you do it, right? Yeah. And yeah. even in classrooms though, when teachers are using Ebley as their foundational instruction in their whole class, and then they're even knowledge building, whatever, Ebley's gonna move them past what these, you know or a basal series or whatever, what the reading is expected, definitely past the decodable books and that type of thing. So the teacher's like, wait a minute, it's kind of a cognitive dissonance. Um, and with parents too, wait, they can really move this quickly? Mm -hmm. How did I not know about this? And then there's that whole thing too. Well, I mean, we have different kinds of learners too. And so we have different kinds of teachers because we have different learning styles, right? Like, okay, you know, well, with, you know with math, how like 80% of us, 90% of us need a pie cut in pieces to understand division, okay? So we get that little visual when we're in math class, when we're a little kid, and then we understand division, okay? And then you have these kids, and I learned about these kids when I trained to be a Waldorf teacher, they have the true math brain. The brain yes. doesn't need the picture, doesn't want, like, don't even put that in front of me. Doesn't mm -hmm. this is the kid who'll get like the chemistry question uh, marked wrong by the teacher because they didn't show the stats. They didn't show. But they I got have a nephew, the right a answer. great nephew, who could teach all the teachers. He's in. He's just starting fifth grade. He could do high school, all of it. I mean, he and he gets in, he gets dinged for not showing the thing. So absolutely that. But I think, but the thing is, is though regardless, like I'm a very visual, show me a chart and show me a thing and show me how it works. Or, you know, I am that, that really resonates with me, but still we're all going to learn to read in the same way. You don't need this kind of reading for that person. Now, somebody, if you show those little kids, those kindergartners, cause you don't know which one is going to be the, you know, great, wonderful math person, they're not going to be harmed by you showing that pie and they, okay, good, but I don't really need that. So I'm going to move ahead. So move them ahead, hopefully, but um, other ones, so it's not going to harm anybody, but we don't need as much of it for sure. And others need more. So I think that as far as dosage and stuff, but everyone learning to read requires the same process for everyone, whether you are severely dyslexic, whether you are highly, you know, gift, you taught yourself to read, you're figuring it out by the code and the concepts in the code, whether you know it or not, right? And when you don't, because English is such a complex code, if you want to learn Spanish, anybody's going to be able to learn Spanish or, or Italian, like Maria Montessori, it's a simple code, one letter, one sound, they don't have 20 ways to spell shh. They didn't take from all these other countries and spellings and all, so they were smart, right? But we borrowed, which is, you know, shows our melting pot and all with English, but I guess the England people do that too, the people in England written, but the English language comes from a whole lot of different, you know, other languages really in ways that they spell things. So that makes it more complex. So if it's more complex, we have to simplify it for our kids, all kids, me too, who was a great reader. I benefited from this instruction. My daughter, who was tremendously a struggling reader, she benefit, everybody in between will benefit from instruction that works. That's like people say, what assessment would we use? I'm like, I don't really care. If it assesses really reading, which we got a lot of assessments out there that are doing some funky things too. But if you were really seeing, can this child read, who cares what assessment it is, right? Because we're gonna teach them with the same skills and concepts and information. That's not gonna change and deliver it in a way that they can you know, integrate it and learn it. Then they'll learn to read. But you're right. Some will be more like, you know, I, I don't know, when you explain it to me, I learn it better. When I see it, I learn it better. You know, but we all use all of those things. Just some of us use, you know, some more than others. Yeah. Well, my Waldorf training is also coming back in, um, in the front of my mind right now as we're talking about this, because in Waldorf, we work with the young children on spoken word. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's a lot of um, rhyming and mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, reciting of poetry and there's a lot of storytelling. The teachers tell stories and there's a lot of let's make a play. Mm -hmm. you know, I, just, um, I just interviewed Tim Rosinski for the same summit uh -huh. you know, who has the Kent state 
you know, mm -hmm. uh, reading clinic. And stuff, yeah. He talked a lot. He talked about readers theater and how we can take a book that we're working with, with a child. And maybe we have multiple kids in the home. Okay. And we can give them parts. Mm -hmm. you know, if there are different characters in the book, we can say, right. okay, why don't you be Mrs. So-and-so and you be Mr. So-and-so and you be the yeah. daughter and you be the son. And then <laughs> we can, make a little play out of it right and so it's all about it's all about how developmentally even as a species we spoke first yes obviously we didn't have writing for a whole long time and i think another point that i need to touch on that you really by talking about all of that right there is about language and and our speaking language and our vocabulary and how you know language is a huge part of all of this i mean i have five grandkids from the age of four one to four and i do you know like my two-year-old grandson he's like oh look at gaga the tree we're christmas time we're driving somewhere and i'm in the back with him he says oh those leaves don't have any trees and these ones are green and i said yeah those are called deciduous trees can you say that deciduous trees yeah they're the ones that lose their leaves and in the spring they'll come back all of that language i mean he uses language at the age of three that you'd be like Word that, but I talk to him like I talk to you. I talk to him with stuff that is meaningful and relevant because he's just noticed it and is interested in it, but it's also going to expand his vocabulary. Everyone comes to school with different levels of that, some with very little. And so their vocabulary is going to very much differ than Arlo's vocabulary, right? But all of those things I also do. He's like, oh, look at Gaga's stop sign. I said, Arlo, say s. He says, s. Say t. He says, t. Say ah, ah, p. p. So he says that and I say, s. Ah, stop. And so now we see a stop sign and he's like, oh, Gaga, a stop sign. I'm like, tell me the sounds. S -t -ah, stop. He knows his name. He's got his book. So now he'll see things like he saw writing on a manhole cover. He's like, oh, look, ah, er, oh, oh, Arlo. Of course, he didn't say Arlo, but he understands that concept that the sounds we say are represented by these squiggles on things. And he's going to learn to read. He's doing our Ebly apps right now, um, you know, as are my other ones. Uh, grandbabies that are older, not the one-year-old jet, one-year-old twins, but um, but still for the, all of them, when we do this and we we understand this importance of the language, and I've teach them the Arlo, Arlo, Bobarlo, you know, Colleen, Colleen, Bobine, Banana, Fana, Fopi. I sing that. I sing it to the twins too because now they're hearing it, and then they start. You start seeing them walking around, you know, up, up, bob, up, Banana, Fana. I mean, they just are singing it under their breath mm -hmm. and doing that rhyming in a way that's fun. So all of it is, connect it's not like, let's make sure you can sound out all these words. Obviously we need to be able to read the words and have the code, but there's a lot more to it than that, including handwriting and spelling and writing and you know fluency and vocabulary and all of those word parts with the prefixes and suffixes and root words, but they can all be taught just like we do in Ebly, integrated. You know, you do an activity in Ebly and those five essential components of reading, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension, along with spelling, writing and um, handwriting, mm -hmm. the process of handwriting, which is really critical, are probably four to eight of them, to all of them, are integrated in one activity. It's not like we're going to teach phonemic awareness over here, and now we have spelling, and over here's some vocabulary, because that doesn't connect in your brain. Like, okay, we did that over there, but I didn't understand that's part of what I need to read or to write as a child. They don't make that connection a lot of times. But when it's integrated and then applied, that's what really makes the connection. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've started having all my students uh, write their little spelling tests in cursive. Mm. I started teaching everybody handwriting. Yeah. But then I we're, realized... We're pretty obsessive with handwriting. I realized this, <laughs> this doesn't have to be separate. And, you know, especially when you have um, the child's hand involved, like they're hearing mm -hmm. the speech from me because I'm having a lot of conversation and speaking a lot with them. And, you know, with my low verbal uh, students, especially we, I make it a point mm -hmm. to have a lot of conversation. Yeah. Um, and so then when that goes into the hand, it's multi-sensory. Like, I feel like your program has all these pillars that they want in structured literacy. Like I'm not seeing the big conflict here. Yeah. Well, the big difference is you don't want to teach both of them. It's kind of like you have a coach. My sister's a softball in the national or the 
Michigan Softball Hall of Fame and she turned and won a state championship with coaching her, her kids. So she coaches kids with pitching and she's like, I can't stand it because these kids come to her high school team and they've had other coaches. Now these other coaches are telling them things that she knows for being a pitcher herself and all. This is not working quite so well. They've spent a lot of money. They've had a lot of repetition. It's causing limitations for them. So she tries to teach her way. Then they go to the coach and they teach another way. So you're teaching the same thing, pitching, in two very different ways that muddies the waters and, and actually kind of harms the kid from being able to do what they really want to do to their highest potential. So some people say, I teach Ebley with OG. I'm like, no, please don't. Because the delivery is tremendously different. When you're doing A at whatever and B b bad or whatever that is, and you're do, spending a lot of instructional time on that. There's a lot of instructional time. I don't care if it's two hours or two months. That's a ton of instructional time before you ever get to a word, right? Mm. We're not going to do that. We're going to teach it in the context of a word, making it meaningful and relevant. That's a huge shift in the delivery, right, of how they're learning it. So that's where the difference is. It's the same information. It's just taught much more quickly and moves them much more efficiently into applying it to reading and applying it to, to writing. And authentic, independent reading and writing, supported for sure at first, you know, but moving them to get to where they're doing that um, intrinsic learning and that self-teaching, which Ebley moves to very quickly. And traditional phonics often holds them back from, because we've got to make sure that you stay right here before, you know, you can't, read a whole lot when you only know the one letter spellings. You have to have a very limited reading application, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to be in those decodable books for sometimes years, right? Where really our kindergarten classroom teachers, the vast majority of their kids are into trade books in kindergarten, definitely in first grade and um, beyond. Because we need those. Those are the bridge that you have to need. You definitely need when you're starting. But when you teach it from this different um, methodology or perspective, makes the difference between how you can apply it both in reading and in writing. And it's hard to explain. I, I have to say, we have some videos that we show okay. where you can see the whole process type of thing because people say, and we hear that all the time. And that's where I like on our Ebley Community Facebook page where people who taught OG, I've never taught OG, but when those who have taught do a much better job than me of explaining it because they actually... I'm just assuming the things that are, I mean, I know in general, but I haven't taught it. Mm -hmm. So they are better at explaining what's really so different here. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a challenge, really, it is a challenge. And we keep doing more things to try to, you know, be clear. And I think we're getting better about that. But because Ebley is not about understanding it cognitively in your head or learning it, it's about applying it mm -hmm. and seeing how it builds on what was taught before. So it's a little, you know, that's a little bit interesting. I mean, would you say it's more kinesthetic? Well, you know, we, there's a lot of talk about multi-sensory. Now, Ebley is very multimodal, but in a way that's not like we're not writing in sand or doing any of that kind of thing. Yeah. What we're doing is you're going to write the word cheese, let's say. Okay. You're going to say the sounds like, what are the sounds in cheese? Ch -e -z. Okay. So we got three sounds. And at first we're going to show them the word, right? So they know the letters and they aren't making mistakes that we have to correct. So what's the first sound in cheese? Ch. How many letters? Two. Write it and say ch. And then e. And then z. So that se. How many people know that that's a, a representation for z? A lot, it's a news to a lot of people. But when they are seeing it, hearing it, seeing it, and touching it. So this is why typing isn't going to work. You have to write those letters and say z. Hmm. When you do that, you're seeing, hearing, saying, touching, doing the motor movement too. It buzzes it into your... Um, neural pathways a whole lot more quickly. But you don't want to be saying cheese and slowly blending. That's not going to do it. You need to segment it. That's a key for a lot of reasons. And you need to do the right. You don't want to say ch and then write the letters. You don't want to say e and then. So there's all these little nuances that are little things that seem like little things that are really big deals, right? So um, that saying the sound as you're right, very efficient. Boom, boom, boom. Here we go. Um, so, yeah, it's very, uh, it's just a, such a paradigm shift, you know, oh. it's a paradigm shift. So Ebley, it is, it works fast. It's uh, speech first and then 
learning the squiggles that are the letters of our language. But in the same activity, I want to say that in the same, because yeah. people are like, well, wait a minute, all instruction does encoding and decoding. Yes. Sometimes we have where we're showing them the word and they're figuring out the sentence, but always the sounds are the priority, right? Mm -hmm. We're, we're paying attention to the sounds and these are symbols that represent them. We're going to teach you how to do that. And we're going to teach you how to be flexible because our language and our code is flexible. We're going to teach you how to do that, how to do that um, set for variability where you're flexing, not just vowel sounds. Everybody loves to talk about the vowel sounds. They get all the, in, you know, all the focus of everything. The consonant sounds, there's a lot of ways to spell every different sound, including consonants. And we don't look at, you know, that or pay much attention or put much, much focus on that. The vowels are always what's talked about, but it goes across the code for all of the sounds, vowels I and think, consonants. Yeah. And when you said the word flexible, something connected for me because I, um, my students go very fast and <clears throat> I'm not an OG trained uh, reading interventionist and we use reading aloud. And I have the student read aloud to me for 30 minutes out of each hour. And I mm -hmm. made my I made my system up and then it just worked. OK. And mm -hmm. when I was telling you before about some of the things that I do with speech with them, you were like, oh, my gosh, this is what we do. Yeah. So I think that there's something um, about flexibility that yeah. makes it so that, but you know, I was asking about gaps. OK, because I was thinking that's what a person who wants to do everything a two year long, very sequential reading remediation would be worried about. Okay. And then I realized just now when you said the word flexibility, okay, that that's why my students have this moment where they're just suddenly able to read, you know, it's like the brain is flexible and the brain and actually fills in the gaps, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we don't, we, we think we, there's a thought process a lot of times that we have to teach them everything. Well, you don't, I mean, nobody's taught me everything about a computer. A lot of it I figure out because I've learned some stuff and now I'm learning more. Now then I get instruction and I learn even more. Right. So we don't need, sometimes people think you have to teach them every single thing about every single thing. And especially just with decoding, but you know, you touched on something with your student too, who has expressive language difficulties. We have to train express. If you, do are not able to express and verbalize well you're not going to be fluent reader you're just not you have to work on that too which is a whole different thing now i have a lot of um what do i want to say um cognitive processing activities that we do for all of these things that working memory and processing speed and all the things that can hold kids back however i hesitate from teaching them too much because what i find is when i teach something in our training People think it applies to everyone, where this might apply to maybe 5% of kids. And you have to be dif differentiate to be able to know which one's there. And some of that is from, I mean, there's a basic thing that we do, of course, our, our whole recipe for Ebley, that's going to help the vast majority. But there are going to be kids that have language difficulty, expressive language, receptive language, all kinds of things. Um, timing and rhythm problems are another big one. Lots of things that are going to hold them back. And we do think, we have, have learned over the years Okay, this is a weakness. How do we strengthen it? That's a how we think here. You're showing us a weakness. If I don't know how to strengthen it, I'm going to learn how, and I'll get back to you. And we learn it quickly. And so, and those are different things, but they're not something that all kids like for for um, language things. Doing a picture or ELL kids creating a picture. Yes, do not create a picture like you were just saying about your kids too. Like they don't need all that stuff. They don't need the pie thing and all that. They don't need a picture. You're wasting their time by drawing a picture because you're doing it with all your kids because it works for a few kids. And that's a really big challenge. Over teaching. Over teaching is a really big problem because we don't, we, it's hard to believe that these kids are going to pick up a lot of this on, you know, their own if we give them a strong foundation. They're not going to pick it up on their own if we just throw them a book and say, go for it. But if we give them a strong foundation, Mark Seidenberg talks about this, the cognitive psychology, uh, psychologist. If we if we start them off, like he calls it the on ramp, they're going to they're going to just fly. Almost all of them. Some need more repetition than others. Some need less, right? Um, but they're going to fly if we've given them a good foundation that helps them make sense in their brain to what we want them to do and how to do it instead of just giving and and keeping the the 
the verbiage low. You know, they don't care about all the things that you know. All those rules that we tell them that only work part of the time, that fills up their brain with stuff that makes them <laughs> you know, unsuccessful a lot of times. Not all of kids, but many kids. That's just like, whoa, what is even going on? This isn't making sense to me. And we've got to be sure that what we're teaching kids is making sense to them and they're applying it right to what they need to do, which is read and spell and write. Yeah. When you were talking about, um, <clears throat> well, with spoken word, okay, and the way that our brain learns and takes naturally, organically in sound, you know, in spoken word, but you mentioned when you would be riding in the car and you would um, do this aside where you explained the definition of something, even as you spoke, like you just kind of included yeah. it in the sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I read, I remember reading a study that was done where they went in to look at what was happening at the dinner table. Because back in the 80s, there was all this research about, you know, does eating dinner together at the dinner table yeah. foster this conversation that then is improving literacy? <clears throat> well, what they found out was that not necessarily it depended on the quality of the conversation at yeah. the dinner table. And actually they isolated it to one behavior, which was when parents give asides during conversation. So what they're doing and an aside is basically when I say, you know, like say I'm mom and I'm a teacher and I'm talking about a child who brought a chameleon to, to, to show and tell today, you know, that little lizard that like mm -hmm. ch changes its, um, <clears throat> its skin based on, its surroundings. And then I keep on telling what happened. Yes. Okay. Well, that thing I said when I went, you know, that blah, 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 I gave yeah. them any definition of a word. Right. And <clears throat> what they found is that um, the children who had the highest literacy and the, the homes that had the highest literacy levels, <clears throat> parents were doing it constantly, constantly giving these little asides. So there it is again, that in our speech, in our conversation, we are allowing the children's brains to adapt yes. and learn and take in all these concepts. So I, <clears throat> I just wanted to make that really yeah. bring that out because that's yeah. That that documentary I wanted to mention this too that I was in not the truth about reading but the um, building the reading brain. Every parent should watch this. I cannot get over it. it's only it's on PBS and it's a half hour long. And when I went to the premiere for that, I was like. How did you, this was a guy who used to be the photographer for the Michigan State marching band, and he started working for PBS. And right as, this was his first assignment to make the reading, you know, making the reading brain. It was the best explanation of how our brain learns to read and including all these things that we're talking about in this discussion. I mean, I'm just like, how, we got to get that out there, which we will do more too with the beginning of the school year happening. But I think too that, um, when you're talking about the conversation, that mom didn't stop and say, let's look up the dictionary and look at the definition for a chameleon, making it where it's integrated into what you do. But also there was some research right when it, back in the nineties, when I was, I read a research paper, um, Stanovich was the researcher that he does the Matthew effect. And he talked about how the, the um, speaking language of college educated people is lower, like the vocabulary that we use is lower than what's in books for preschoolers. OK, like, you know, very hungry caterpillar or what I don't know, whatever preschool books have a richer vocabulary than the speaking language of of college educated people. So we have to be mindful to purposefully share use instead of using the word great, use the word fantastic, phenomenal, spectacular, you know, and I use those words with my grandchildren and they say those words. Even the babies are starting to say, you know, these great big two and three syllable words. And it's like, oh my God, it's just amazing what they, you know, pick up with all of that. And also the, you know, the reading of, of children's books and how important all of that is. But that integrating learning into life, which is really what life is, is all about, right? And that's an easy thing for parents. When, you're, when you got those kids in a the car, they're a captive audience. So I use that all the time. <clears throat> well. Nora, I feel like I've kept you here forever and I could keep you for all days, but I have to let you go. But before I do, you have a, a really special free gift for our audience. So I'm going to um, ask you to tell about that a little and then we'll put up a, a QR code um, okay. so, so that they can download this, this gift right away. But 
Okay. What is well, it is it's actually 50% off one of our mini courses, which we created for parents, for parapros, for people supporting kids with reading and with spelling. And because when you increase spelling, you increase reading even more. And we know if your spelling is low, that, um, you know, that's going to impact your reading. So we decided to offer 50% off of our Ebly um, spelling mini course. So if you put your camera on this QR code, you can get to that. There's going to be a code for the 50% off. It's Ebly, as you see up there, uppercase, E-B-L-I, spelling with an uppercase S, Ebly spelling 2024. That's the code. Look at there. Look at it. <laughs> lady popping up on the screen. So if you use this code, you can get this for $12 or yeah, $12.50. And Anything I give, um, if you go to our website, ebly.com, we do lots of webinars and I always give information that's immediately applicable. I just don't need more things to fill up my brain. And I don't know many people that just need more information, right? Especially if you're trying to teach kids. You want to have something that you can actually apply. There's a lot of great things in there. A handwriting webinar, I highly recommend that. There's a lot of good stuff in there. But this course is me showing you things that you can do with the writing that your kids do. And then they have misspelled words. Like my daughter that was a struggling reader, she loved to write. So she would write and 50% of the words would be, I couldn't read it, right? Writing is not very effective, you can't read it. So I decided to give 50% uh, off this spelling course. So here's the code. I hope that you use it. Um, if you have any questions on that Ebly community page, we have Ebly trained people and Ebly curious people. Go on there, ask your questions, go on there and interact with other people who are also exploring um, and, you know, and to learn more. I always say to people to be skeptical about everything, but especially things in education and, and even more specifically in literacy. So if you think like this lady's a little crazy, I'm feeling kind of skeptical, please do, right? Please be skeptical, but look into your, it yourself, educate yourself more, try out some things. We have, if you have older kids who are struggling, read, well, fifth, sixth grade and above up through adult, we have some free lessons. They're called Ebly Supercharge Lessons on YouTube. Um, you can do those. Or if you want to see for yourself what Ebly's about, grab a whiteboard and a marker and go and do those yourself because they'll give you a good idea. It's, you know, it's probably about 10, 15% of what we teach, but it gives you a good idea of what that looks like. So, because with Ebly talking about it, you know, kind of like I said, I'm a visual person, seeing it in action is so much more powerful really for everybody than hearing about uh, me trying to explain it for sure. But in our webinars, we also have some really great webinars uh, um, about the differences between structured linguistic literacy or speech first, speech to print, and it, as far as a methodology and traditional phonics or print to speech. So educate yourself. Um, I'm so happy that you guys are here and thanks for listening to me on and on. Parents have a special place in my heart because I've been where you're at. Um, whether you're, I've had you know, I have three girls and and one of them is tremendously high reader, just picked up reading in first grade with the Abeka program and read The Little House on the Prairie, the entire series in six weeks. And I'm like, oh, look at look at my smart kid. And then my next one came along with the same instruction and it didn't quite go that way. And then my third one, who's also left handed and very math oriented. And I'm like, you are going to learn to read before you go to school. So uh, I got to to make that happen, too. So I know where you're coming from. And um, yeah, there's a lot more of us. And I do want to say one more thing, if I can, Linda, that I think I've had so much experience. I've been in thousands of classroom coaching Ebly teachers. We used to have in-person training. To We just went all online, interestingly, in February of 2000 on purpose, or 2020, um, right before COVID hit. But we used to do all in-person, and I did tons and tons of, of in-person coaching. Um, and so I've been in schools. I've here we have parents that come to our reading center. I interact with a lot of administrators. I've done stuff with legislative people. I've seen this from an outside perspective, really, from a lot of different angles. And who do I think is going to change the trajectory of literacy? Parents. It gives me chills, actually, when I just said that. I'm almost positive. This is going to have to happen with parents who are also coming from a bunch of different angles. And there's a lot of different parent organizations out there now that even guide you um, to how to do that. Um, and parents, when you're educated and when you are interacting without being triggered, which is tricky, uh, with the schools and, you know, they really want the best for the kids too. So many teachers haven't been taught how to teach reading. That was true in 97. It's still true today for the majority of them. And they don't even know that they don't. And now that things are becoming opened up where they see like with Soul the Story and all these different things, like, wait a minute, talk about triggering. You know, I spent all this money and all this time on my education and I've been doing all these things. And now you're telling me, wait. 
So they're going through a lot of trauma too. So working together instead of against, because there's a lot of, you know, oftentimes, you know, push me, pull you stuff uh, with that. And I was the one back when my daughter couldn't read, I went on into that principal's office and said, what's what? And, and I, so I know from that perspective too, (laughs) didn't go over well. Uh, And I pulled my kids out actually and put them in a charter school for a few years and a bunch of other families did also, but that maybe didn't have to happen. It may, back then there wasn't nearly as much open. There's a lot more awareness. There's a lot more going on. So I, but parents are going to be the ones to lead the way. So you go figure out how, you know, it, it's going to be done differently with different people, but you are it. So thank you for that. And you had um, mentioned to me something about parent advocate groups. Um, so, you know, a lot of our audience are, not dealing with the school system currently as in because their child is at home yeah. learning. Right. Um, however, there might be some parents watching who might be um, dealing with a system that their child is in that they feel like um, they're not getting the help they need. And so just to let them know that it's possible to form these, it's like parent advocacy groups, right? Right. Right. Well, and also what we see a lot too, even at our center, we have parents that will pull their kids out and homeschool for a period, especially till they're strong readers, because the instruction that they're doing with Ebley isn't pushing against, you know, and diluting it because it's different. And then they put them back in. So a lot in kids, sometimes when they get older, want to go and a lot of kids too, that are homeschooled, you were in the schools and it was like, wait a minute, I need to, you know, bring them home and take care of this situation too. And others are just homeschoolers that they've done homeschooling the whole time. So I think that there's a variety. And I think even if it is homeschool, people are in communities that have schools. And for me, like I could have stopped at teaching my daughter, you know, and I could have stopped at volunteering and teaching my friend's kids because everybody has a child who's subliterate, mm-hmm. at least one, it seems. But I couldn't. I mean, my soul wouldn't let me. I've devoted my life to this because I just, sometimes I want to, this is not fun. A lot of times not doing the work, but interacting in the space. Sometimes there's just a lot of stuff there, but many people who get trained in Ebley for their child end up doing, you know, being a private practitioner that work with, because there's such a huge need and they're like, wait a minute, I'm not going to, so you don't have to do that, but you could, But also you could do things where let's get a group of six or eight of us together. This is how so many of these parent advocacy groups happen because you're going to listen to you when you're knowledgeable, when you, you know, go into the school board meetings where you have people from newspapers there or whatever that are going to, you know, you can talk to. It's amazing to me every single week. I just had a conversation yesterday. I have people, oftentimes parents who reach out and have the one yesterday, she quit her job as a very high, powerful job. And now, because she said I was led to do some literacy, it had nothing to do with literacy. It was actually with Amazon. And she's like, "No, I've got." It. She watched the Truth About Reading, which if you haven't watched that, you can even get it on Tubi. I think it's called for free. But if you go to Ebley's website, we have a whole documentary thing that tells the whole history of it. Great, uh, great story, and you'll learn a lot there too. But you know, sharing these things, this movie has brought so many people to me. Like, oh my gosh, this is everywhere. This is in my house. This is in my business. This is in my community. This is everywhere. Um, and it's really driven people to want to take action. And I'm a big one on taking action. We can all, we've admired this problem for so long, but <laughs> taking action. And I don't, a lot of parents, these people that talk to me, I'm like, oh my gosh, what great ideas. Everybody has great ideas, but whatever your great idea is, just act on it, take action. Um, because together, we don't have to be these islands. Let's work together and, you know, and accelerate, you know, let's make it more efficient, how, you know, and accelerate moving toward high level literacy for all. That's really what I hope to see happening in my lifetime. And, and I'd love for you also, to help. Yes, it's also a totally different thing when uh, five parents show up in the principal's office. Yes. Right? Yep. Safety and mm-hmm. numbers. But then, the, yeah. but then they have to see, this is not just one person complaining. Yes. This yes. is, and it's a, well, that's a good point too. And it's a, it's a, you know, and we're trying and coming from a thing like we're trying to help you to help all kids. I'll never forget. This was many years ago in my reading center. I had a student um, here 
who was just leaving the mom's like, he's the only one in their school that has this problem. The principal said nobody else. They're walking out the door and a new student's coming in. It's classmate, the classmate to this child. And they're like, wait, you have, you're having reading struggles too? Um, so people don't talk about it. It's like this shame-based secret that we want to hide. But when you do start to talk about it, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, everyone is experiencing this. Yeah. And there's power in numbers, like you say, Linda. Yes, power in numbers. And who knows, you probably have the most wonderful idea of how to really just blow this thing up and really make a ton of uh, you know forward progress with it. So don't be shy and don't think, oh, I'm only one person. I can't do something because that's not true. You can, not just for your own kids. And if you stop there, that's okay too. But Keep talking. We all can do something for it. Thank you, Nora. Yes, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, we'll just keep on the fight. <laughs> uh, literacy for forward. all. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much.